cows grazing in a meadow. There couldn't be a more typical, a more tranquil English country scene. But believe it or not, these most domesticated of animals can just occasionally prove to be rather dangerous. Just ask John Hine. He's a keen rambler whose peaceful Sunday walk turned into a nightmare when he tried to cross a field where there was a herd of French limousine cows. In our reconstruction, John is played by an actor, and we've used a different breed of cow. I was indulging my Come. Sunday afternoon hobby Come. of uh, the great cross-country walks in England Come. with my dogs. And on that Sunday, I was Come. on the Oxfordshire Way, which goes from Come. Bolton on the water to Emley on Thames. Good. We went under the M40 Good. through a, a pedestrian way, through a field, great. when we came Come. to a stile. Through the stile. And I saw uh, there was a herd of cows in the field, big deal. Good dogs. Wait. So I put the dogs on their chains because I always put the dogs on the chains if there's any animal about anywhere, Jump. and Jump. got into the field. Yeah. Got about halfway into the field when I realised that uh, we got ourselves into something. The first thing that happened was the, the noise. The, the, the cattle started making a baying noise that I've never heard cows make before. It was spooky, something like a horror movie, the sort of noise that you get from a sequence where something hellish is happening somewhere. And they started, and it grew louder, and it grew louder, and it grew louder. And then they started running towards us. Cows, in order to be able to get to the dogs, which was obviously what was concerning them, had to go through me, and that's exactly what they did do. They tell me after the event that my injuries were a broken leg, a broken breastbone, fractured ribs, crushed lung, and then two hits on the head. I came round, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out what the hell I was doing in the field. I couldn't understand why I couldn't move. And then I started looking around me, and I saw the cows right at the very far end of the field, and that sort of rang a bell. But it took quite a long time to remember what had happened. John was now so badly hurt that he couldn't even get to his feet. One of his dogs stayed with him, while the other went for help. The thought occurred to me that I hadn't seen anybody else on the walk. How the heck is anybody going to find me? And then it dawned on me, I've got a mobile phone with me. And I dialed 999. And then this angel turned up on the other end. This lovely voice, which I shall always remember. Ambulance service, can I help you? Yes. I'm in a field. Yep. I've been attacked by cattle. Oh, dear. I have a broken leg. I can't move. OK, sir. Whereabouts are you? I'm beyond the village of Petsworth. Beyond the village? When the caller came through to me, um, he was very calm, and I thought it was going to be a, just a general call of somebody else in trouble. When he proceeded to say, I'm in a field and I've been attacked by cattle, it was a bit of a shock because I wasn't expecting that. And then, obviously, the next thing, the, the important thing was to find out where he was. Box on control to 801, priority message. 801, go ahead. Hey, John, we have an instance at Tetsworth. When we got the call, it was quite an unusual call because all we had at the time was an incident in Tetsworth, which could have been anything. And then we had to wait for further information. I think I'm going to send the duty officer on this one as well. Box on control is... Alpha 05, go ahead, over. I was attending another incident, which was only a few miles away from where this incident was taking place, so that was a piece of luck. I was in the area at the time. Right, and you believe it's just your leg that's um, badly yes. fractured at the moment? And I've been kicked in the chest by the right. cattle. The cattle are coming back now. Right. Um, I said, too hard, because those damn cows are coming back again. And indeed they were, and this was terrifying, because... Whereas before I could at least put up an effort and, and run, now I was lying on, on the grass and I couldn't even crawl. We had no idea where he was, and therefore there was a lot of detective work went into it by my colleague Arthur and myself yeah, I've on the map. to actually ascertain where he might here. be. There's some buildings around here. Could he be there somewhere? I've got his mobile phone number. Do you want to try and call him back? 
Lewis, sir, can you hear me? Yes. We're looking on a map at where you are. Yes. Are you anywhere near any farm building? Yes, I am. Alpha Zero Five, where are you, over? I'm about three miles from the village of Tetsworth, over. Roger, we think we've located the incident. It's at a farm on the Oxfordshire Way. I drove up into the farm with my lights and everything going. There was a young farmhand who saw me coming, obviously wondered what was going on. The ambulance was just a short way behind me at this time. Have you called for an ambulance? No. You haven't? Could you tell me, where is the Oxfordshire Way? Oxfordshire Way, yeah. yeah. It starts right over there in Tetchworth and then goes down behind that edge and runs for miles. And what's that dog doing there? It's not your dog. No, it's not mine. Do you think you could go over and have a look and see if there's anything over there? Yeah, fine. Just let us know if there is. All right, you wait here. I'll be, I'll be back. I'll be OK. Back. Hey, over here. I found him. The first thing that it reminded me of was the Lassie story. As though one dog had said to the other one, you go and get help and I'll guard my master. Hello, sir. My name's Trish. I'm here to help you. What's your name? John. OK, John. Can you come in behind, John? John if we hadn't have arrived when we okay? did, then Mr Hine wouldn't be here today. He would have died either from blood loss or from his serious chest injuries. That's lovely. Just relax, John. Take Alpha nice zero 05 from Central. We're Alpha zero 05, I think we're going to require the helicopter. Unbeknown to me at that time, the helicopter had monitored our channel. They'd heard what was going on and they started heading in our direction anyway. That's when the cows started to take notice again. They then started coming towards the helicopter. The ambulance technician actually got a fire extinguisher, which he didn't discharge, but he held the fire extinguisher ready just in case the cows did make a run for us. He was so calm. That was the one thing that was so strange. I mean, if I'd been trampled by cows, I don't think I would have been so calm, especially as the cows were in the background. I mean, they were still in the field that we were in, and there was always the possibility that they were going to come up and see us again. John is now well on his way to recovery. It was so incredible that, one, John was actually attacked by cows. I mean, I walk my dogs through cow's field and never had any trouble before, so that was unusual. It was unusual that he managed to uh, phone on his mobile phone and that he actually had one because nobody, I don't think anybody would have found him, not where he was. And three, that his dogs attracted our attention. Those dogs were just wonderful. And as I walked up to them, they were wagging their tails so much they nearly fell over because they were so pleased to see me. I did go to visit him in the hospital and to see him sitting there, it was, it was a wonderful feeling. It just made, my, made me feel that my job is worthwhile. Well, I fully intend to go back and finish off the Oxford Way, the last 20 miles from Tetsworth to Henley. Um, but a lot of my friends have advised me that perhaps it would make a lot more sense to take up a, a safer Sunday afternoon pursuit, such as paragliding, bungee jumping, hurling oneself off a cliff. I don't know. In Britain, more than 120,000 miles of countryside paths like this one are open to the public. They can be beautiful, but also potentially dangerous. There are more than one and a half million accidents in fields and parklands every year in the UK. To make the most of any time you spend in the country, it's important not only to look after the countryside, but as we've just seen, you need to look after yourself too. So here's our 10 point guide on how you can enjoy the countryside safely. Don't take chances with animals. Cows are inquisitive and in the same way John Hine experienced may chase you, particularly if you have dogs. Cows with calves are the biggest danger and they don't need to attack you to hurt you. Even a playful bull or pig can kill. If you end up in a field with livestock, move slowly, quietly and try to walk around them. Keep your dog under control. If it chases any farm animals, it's legally considered to be worrying them, and farmers are within their rights to shoot it. 
Chemicals sprayed on crops to protect them can harm people. Look for warning signs on the gates of sprayed fields. Don't walk, eat or drink there and never pick hedgerow fruit. If you think you've been exposed to chemicals, wash yourself and your clothes immediately. If you feel sick or have breathing difficulties, get medical advice. Watch children. Haystacks make great dens but can collapse or catch fire with lethal consequences. Grain bins seem good places to play until the grain begins to move. Anyone stuck inside would suffocate. On farms, slurry pits are major hazards. In the last five years, six children have drowned in them. There should be fencing, padlocks and sealed grids to keep children out. But don't take risks. Keep your children away. Agricultural machinery can be very dangerous, so never let children near it. No child under 13 may drive or ride on tractors and keys should be removed from all machinery not being used. Twelve and a half thousand people are injured walking or running each year in Britain, so proper preparation is essential. Take a detailed map. Remember, a compass will only help you if you know how to use it. Carry a torch in case it gets dark and a whistle to call for help. The international distress signal is six blasts on a whistle, followed by a one-minute pause, then repeated again. The same signals can be made with a torch or by waving a cloth. If someone you're with is hurt, don't move them. Keep them warm. If there's more than two of you, someone should stay with them while you get help. Make sure you know their exact location. If you think you'll have trouble finding your way back, use any available materials like stones as markers. If you get stuck in a remote or highland area, it's worth knowing the signal to draw the attention of any helicopter searching for you. Wear the brightest thing you can. Face the helicopter with your arms open wide in the shape of a Y, the internationally recognised code for help needed here. You can also make this shape on the ground with rocks. But don't wave. The crew could well just wave back and fly away. If you'd like more information about where you can go and what you can do safely in the countryside, the Countryside Commission is giving away these free booklets. If you'd like one, send an A4-sized stamped addressed envelope to Country Code, the Countryside Commission Postal Sales, PO Box 124, Waldgrave, Northampton, NN6 9TL. That's Country Code, the Countryside Commission Postal Sales, PO Box 124, Waldgrave, Northampton, NN6 9TL. And we'll give you that address again at the end of the programme. Last week, I started to explore the world of virtual reality that's being used to help train fire crews. Computer simulations like this can predict smoke movement from fires and how people will react when they see the smoke. Difficult locations can be explored to rehearse for major emergencies and even evacuations. This system is being tested at the Fire Service College at Morton in the Marsh as part of their computer training lectures. OK, what I want to show you on the virtual reality system today is a representation of an incident that actually happened to me as part of a crew in Merseyside Fire Brigade. There was a paved area in front of the house. Unfortunately, they'd put bollards across it. The nearest we could get the appliances was about 150 yards. Wearing our breathing apparatus, we had to run across this area and enter the front of the house. We were aware at that point that there were two children trapped in there. In this particular case, I want you to attempt to rescue a virtual representation of the BBC presenter, Juliet Morris. Yep, she's looking pretty hideous, but it's not really surprising because I'm going to leave her stranded upstairs in this house, just like the children in the actual fire. While officers fight the virtual fire back in the computer room, this practical training exercise reconstructs what actually happens to Joe Simpson. Our priority was to search upstairs where people would have a chance. There's a kid here, Joe! We found one child actually hiding in a wardrobe from the heat and the flames and got him out, got him clear. I went back into the premises at that point and found that the stairs were beginning to burn away. They were certainly unstable as I, as I climbed back to the upper floor of the, of the house. 
I realised that because of the development of the fire at that point, that the stairs were actually burning away. Well, there's a, there's a bed. We searched further on into the rooms and we found another child down the side of a, of a small bed which had been pushed against the wall. And I moved into the front room of the house, passed the child to another firefighter who was on a ladder which had been pitched to the window. I came down the ladder at the front of the building and I'd sustained burns to my neck and hands as well. At that point, the fire flashed over and there was tremendous heat generated. It was a sort of rescue where every second counts and they were lucky to get everyone out safely when they did. So could virtual reality training have given them a different approach? When the fire investigation was carried out, it was found that there was a small road running down the back of the premises and we would have actually been able to get the appliances round to that point. We have to stand back and take an overview, not get tunnel vision. With virtual reality, we can look at the whole incident, different ways in, different ways out, and it would have saved seconds, yes. It's much more serious than a computer game. The aliens you kill in a video game aren't real. This thing could save real lives. Fourteen-year-old Paula Roberts has reason to be grateful to an unusual sort of hero. Her dentist, Peter Mullen, came to her rescue when an accident threatened to alter her looks forever. Well, that evening, my friends called for me, so I went over to the shop where everybody hangs out. I turned around to talk to my friend, and at the same time, this boy threw a frisbee and they threw it wrong. It just hit me across the face, across my cheek. The pain was just so bad on my cheek. My friends took me over home there at that moment. Mum and Dad were in the room, and when I came in, seen all the blood, and they were completely horrified by the side of the blood. Paula, played by an actress, was taken to hospital in Downpatrick, who referred her to the emergency dentist, by chance, her own dentist. When we got to the surgeon, had a look at her teeth to find that one of the front teeth had been pushed backwards and needed to be jiggled back into its place again properly. The other front tooth was missing completely. She's it's, lost her It's completely gone. Could I just couldn't believe it because it spent so long getting my teeth fixed and then thinking everything's going to be OK and then turn around and tell me that there's one missing and I was like, God, you know, I'm going to have to wear a false tooth now and that's going to be for being so young and for going out places, having to wear a false tooth. Dad, how is she? No, she's going to be I asked Paula's family to go and try and find the tooth and bring it into the practice as quickly as possible. They were to phone home and get someone at home to go and find the tooth. Right, OK, I'll go and get my torch. Because it was dark outside and where it was, there was no hardly any lights and it was all glass and all. I thought, God, they're never going to find it because it could have been anywhere. And second was, it's fell out now, there's no use now because you can't get it put back in again. If a tooth has been out of the mouth for up to 45 minutes, there's a very, very good chance that it will re-implant successfully. If it's been out of the mouth for more than 45 minutes and it's stored properly, perhaps in milk, ideally in milk, then it can last perhaps for up to six hours. Ah, oh, good lad, well done. Let's have a look and see. When the tooth came back to the surgery, I cleaned it and put it back into place. I asked Paula to press up on it with a thumb and then I splintered the teeth together. After a couple of weeks, it's nearly as good as new. And the best thing about it is Paula does not have to wear a denture. Well, now I see him as like my hero for what he's did to me. And I'm just very grateful for him for that. Paula had looked after her teeth well for years and years. She had been a regular patient. She had a lovely smile. And I was in the position of being able to sort everything out for her, fix her smile again. Well, it was this year tooth here, just beside the front one. And now it's looked so nothing ever happened. It's just really back to normal. In fact, it's probably better than what it was at the start. Often just one tiny mistake can lead to tragedy. When Roy Darville misread a tide timetable, it turned a pleasant day's fishing for him and his family into a nightmare. They'd gone to a well-known fishing spot called Whistling Sands near Puthwelly in North Wales. In our story, Roy, his son Peter and step-granddaughter Katie are all played by actors. Well, we've got a wonderful day for it, Peter. The family's going to love it up here. Good idea, Dad. Well, it's great to be together again, isn't it? My boy came up from Cornwall for the day, and uh, he's very fond of fishing. 
You can gut them when we get home, okay? Yeah. Like that. <laughs> Not only that, you've got to cook them. <laughs> so we made our way to Whistling Sands and uh, walked along the beach looking for a nice spot to cast off and try a lap. We was having a great time. Yes! Like an expert. Oh, yes! Sitting in the sun, <laughs> nice, flat, quiet sea. How are you doing, Kate? OK. In fact, I can catch more than you can. <laughs> <laughs> no breeze, nice and warm. Watching our floats, waiting for it to bubble to catch fish. Yeah, 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 yeah. We know who's going to catch all the fish today. The sea turned in a second, actually in a second. It went from calm and the wave started. It's a very bad region there, it's a riptide. As well as getting up a bit, it's freezing. It's getting fresh. Well, it is freezing, and then um, next minute, um, we started seeing this, the sea coming fast and all the waves it was, started getting high. I don't like the look of this at all, then. I think you've got your toads wrong, yeah? It won't come any higher. I hope you're right. We could get cut off here. Look, we can't get across there anymore. We can completely cut off. We've read the timetable, but we'd read it for a, 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 what, seven miles up the coast. We didn't realise, although we'd read the timetable right, we didn't realise that the tide was two hours difference. Dad, the water's still rising. We're going to have to do something. If we sit here, we can sit here, Dad. It'll be all right. We can't, Dad. We're going to drown here. If we stay here. I was terrified. But, uh, you know, that if... I didn't think we was going to survive, to be honest. Look, I'm going to swim for the shore. I've got a pretty good chance of making it. You'll never make it, Peter. Look, it's a choice of me trying or you and Katie drowning. I wasn't oh, keen on him going. I'll try. But uh, it was uh, one take a chance or three die as far as we saw it. He didn't really want me to go. So I said, well, if I don't try and jump in, one of us will make it. I thought I just had to do it, so I did. Oh, I felt absolutely terrible. My heart was pounding and I felt really ill. The minute he plunged, he went under the water. <clears throat> and for me, that was the worst of it all. I thought he'd gone. And uh, I stood there looking and the, the waves was washing over where I last saw him. It was the thought of watching my son die. It was just so cold, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't see, and I was just under the water the whole time. I was just hoping that I could grab hold of something to get myself out. Our support, Busy Green, can help you. Missing person, north coast of the Clean Peninsula. Yes, sir, thanks for that. Job on Steve? Yeah, I think so. Rob, can you look at this for us, please? Yeah, Don't worry, Kate, it's going to be all right. He just come to help. I thought we was going to die. I didn't think there was any way that we could possibly survive. I just thought I was never going to see my mother and the rest of my family again. Roy and Katie's only hope now was the skill of the North Wales Police Air Support Unit, but they're not equipped for this sort of incident. We're not a rescue helicopter at all. We have no winch, we have no training for it at all. Uh, we do go to road traffic accidents, we will land on the road or in a field nearby. Actually, cliff, cliff rescue or anything over the sea is really not, not our empire. Uh, it's more the Air Force. It'll be all right. Oh, Mum! No. <laughs> Peter's gone for help. You see, just hold on, darling. We'll be all right. The police were still only expecting to pinpoint the location of Roy and Katie so that a properly equipped rescue helicopter could winch them to safety. But that plan would have to be changed. I don't think this is a missing person anymore. It's more of a rescue, really. Look, Katie. We realised straight away that it really was a job for the uh, Air Force rescue helicopter. But at the same time, we realised that by the time they were called out and arrived on the scene, they could well have been washed off the rock. Can we do anything for them, Rob, because uh, we haven't done anything like this before? Oh, we haven't got a winch. It's going to take too long for the RF rescue to get out here. Uh, 
you've got a harness. Get a harness on. We're going to have to go down. I can try and hover on side. Right along they realise the they'd have to hover low and pick Roy and Katie straight from the rock. The biggest problem was the possibility of uh, the waves breaking uh, and putting an engine out, I suppose, is my biggest worry. OK, we're about 20 feet above the sea. Can we please slow it down just a little bit right. and uh, right. bring it down in height from uh, 15 now down to 10, 15, and slow it down there. OK, we're about two to three feet above the sea. Sideways now, five feet, five feet. I was outside single-engine capability. I, if an engine failed, okay, I would have gone splash into the water. So I didn't think about it a lot of the time. It's more afterwards that I thought well, I had been flying outside the rules, as they were. But as it was life and death, I didn't think it was a problem. It came right down to the rock, and the man just grabbed my hand and had us stepped up on the rocks and then stepped on the helicopter. I do have uh, two girls of my own, actually, and uh, I could imagine, really, a set of circumstances really involving my own children. And uh, I suppose that I didn't, so I didn't experience fear whatsoever. It was just that I wanted to do something for these people. Warm reached out, took Katie first, and that ski was no more than two inches from the tip of the rock. I squeezed her and said, we're quite safe now, dear. I said, no need to worry anymore. Peter, who against all the odds had managed to survive his swim and raise the alarm, was about to be reunited with his family. We had a good reunion after. Yeah, we sure did, yeah. And uh, we've been very, very much closer ever since. I think they took that risk well, to save our life. And I'm quite adamant they risked their life to save ours. I think if we'd left it any longer, there was a great possibility that they'd have been washed off the rocks and into the sea. And uh, I think with them we'd have witnessed something pretty horrific. All I can say really is that it's an extension of a police officer's role, and that is the protection of life. I think it was very dangerous, but he risked his life to save us, though. There's been such a huge response to the information leaflet mentioned during the series that some have now had to be specially reprinted, and so we're sorry that there may be a delay of a few weeks in sending them out.